Hi. As you can see, I think, from the screens, my title evolved. I was also assigned a title. It's the one that's on the program, and it's not that one. And uh, I guess Feng Gong is a better citizen than me, and he's, he's stuck to his, but my, mine changed. Anyway, there it is. Um, let me dive right in, because this is really a longer talk than 20 minutes. And that's why I'm starting with a conclusion, <laughs> in case I run out of time. I want to start by talking about broad religious changes in the 20th century, things that have really characterized global religion, not in Todd Johnson's numbery way uh, with him and Brian in the room. I'm not going to make my feeble attempt at doing any kind of a number, but really to think more qualitatively about broad trends. And I'm going to talk about four, although some of them are related to each other, Secu secularization, uh, by which I mean separation of church and state, or separation of society and religion, rather than dereligionization. I'll talk about that in a minute. Religionization, which I'll define um, in a minute, rationalization and embodiment. So those four, uh, um, I'll come to those in a second. I want to talk about those just in general as global religious trends, and then think about how those have taken place in two different Chinese societies. Not, if any of you have read any of those books of mine, you know I often compare Taiwan and China. Taiwan and China is actually not a good comparison in some ways. Um, China's too big and too varied. Um, Taiwan's a very small piece out of that. I spent last year living in Nanjing in southern Jiangsu province. And that's actually a much better comparison with Taiwan. If you're trying to control for uh, wealth, for instance, it's pretty close to Taiwan. If you're trying to compare for educational levels, n not too far from Taiwan. And compared to China's averages, much closer to Taiwan than to, uh, say, Guangxi or Gansu or someplace like that. So really, most of what I'm going to draw on today is southern Jiangsu, the wealthier part of that province, and Taiwan. Um, that allows us to control for many of the variables and kind of reduce things to the gigantic political separation uh, that, that pulled Taiwan apart from China in 1895 when the Japanese came over, um, right? They were colonial rulers of Taiwan for 50 years until 1945. The two places are united for four years, and that's it, right? Then it's the communists on the mainland and the, and the Republican government in Taiwan. So in the last, uh, now well over a century, 120 years almost, um, there's only those four years when it's one political regime, so that we have these really different political um, systems. And I, I want to, especially toward the end of the talk, compare uh, the results in the two. And one of them, kind of counterintuitive result, is while both places have really responded to these global changes in religion, and they're very much part of the pattern that I hope to identify, the result in Taiwan is something that looks a lot more Chinese in some unexpected kinds of ways. That is a lot more drawing on indigenous resources. So even though in an abstract level, it's responding to the same trends. The specific developments look much more uniquely Chinese. And a lot of this has to do with a comparison of Buddhism and Christianity that I'll get to at the end. I hope I'll get to at the end. And uh, I will talk about civil society issues a bit at the end. So these broad trends. First, secularization. So as I said, most people use secularization to mean a kind of dereligionization. And that's what the, the sociology of secularization, like in the 1960s, um, really meant that. That's wrong. And many of those sociologists who made a name talking about the inevitability of secularization, of despiritualization, themselves now say they were wrong. Uh, so, um, you know, without much uh, spending time on the issue, that's just not what I mean. Uh, and certainly, as, as Jan Fengang's talk made clear, there's no way you can look at China or, or as, uh, as the first talk made it clear also, there's no way you can look at China and say it's secularized in that sense. So I mean a different sense of secularization, something closer to its earlier uses in Europe, which is a separation of the, a religious sphere from the other spheres of society. So w where you have separation of church and state, which was um, talked about in um, Wang Xiaoli's talk, uh, right as a, for a fundamental thing that we see in this country with the revolution, of course. Um, but not just that. This, the creation of religion as a separate sphere of thought. 
And let me just give you an example. This one is from Taiwan, but we could find similar things in, in China, too, where this happens in both places in the early 20th century. It's the creation of modern constitutions, 1911 in China, and of course in Taiwan we're dealing with the Japanese constitution, which is created earlier, um, all of which build in some kind of separation of church and state. So in uh, the town I worked in most in Taiwan on this project is uh, called Lukang, a kind of small town, about 20,000 people. And the Japanese, like good colonial rulers everywhere, did a lot of social scientific studies of the population. They give us better data than the Qing Dynasty ever gave us. And they did a survey of all the social organizations in Lugang in 1923. Every single one of these social organizations, there were 66 of them at the time, everything from you know, the butchers or the coffin makers to the trade associations who, who uh, ran trade with various ports on the mainland uh, to lineages. They were all organized as God-worshipping societies, Shen Ming Hui. That is, at the center of each one was an altar to various gods. The head of the association, even a business guild, the head of the association was called Lu Zhu, incense pot master, the same title given to the head of a temple. This is because religion was just part of the functions of these things. You couldn't actually separate these, I'll call it religion, we were arguing at lunch about whether this even was religion or not. Um, if you call those religion, it was part of daily life for people. It was inseparable from purely social organizations. So the Japanese do this uh, uh, census in 1923. They count them, there are 66 of them. Um, and then they say, okay, this God association thing, you can't do it anymore. Or not exactly you can't do it anymore, but it has no legal basis. So that if somebody, if somebody um, acts illegally in one of these associations, there's no more law. So that you can't take them to court, you can't do anything about it legally. If you want to be legal, you're going to have to organize in a new secular way without a religious basis to it. And so we get the beginnings of NGOs and other kinds of secular social organizations. 1923, you can mark it to the year in, in Taiwan. It's quite similar in China, too, where, where the uh, Republican government is really pretty unsympathetic to religion in general, especially folk religion. Many temples closed down then or converted to government offices um, or simply torn down. That is, communist policy that we see after 1949 actually has a lot of precursors in Republican policy that happened before 1949. In any case, what happens is a secularization in the sense that religion becomes a separate category of life and of thought. So as soon as you do that, you have to have religion, right? You can't create religion as a separate sphere without a concept of religion. And there is no concept that exactly translates an, the English word religion before the 20th century in China or in Taiwan. So those of you who know Chinese, right, you can immediately translate religion into Chinese. It's zongjiao. It, we all know that. That's a 20th century word. Coined in Japan, actually, to translate European, the European word religion. There's, a, I don't have time to tell the story. There's, at the 1893, the first kind of um, meeting of all the world's religions, it was in Chicago, they wanted a Confucianism guy, and they got somebody from the consulate, the Chinese consulate in Washington. Of course, a, a Confucian official, right? This was still the examination system. Um, and he comes and he, we have his speech still. It's really funny. He says, religion. I'm supposed to talk about religion. I have no idea what this means. I looked it up in all the dictionaries. I still have no idea what it means. Right, clearly, the, there was no word that really translated it yet in English. Uh, I some, in the questions, you can ask me the rest of that story. It's kind of funny what, how, what, how he deals with it. But he ends up just basically saying religion, li li jiao en, or something like that. He just uses the sounds, the English sounds because he says there's no word. There's no word that means this in Chinese. So it's coined. It's coined, well, it's coined first in Japan, right? So it's introduced into Taiwan through Japan. But in both places, it's the early 20th century where we get a category of religion because you can't secularize without creating religion at the same time. Now, what is this religion? So if you're going to create it, what does it mean? What's the definition? And both the Japanese version and the nationalist version in China um, or rather similar to each other, and basically 
similar to Protestant kinds of definitions. Not surprising given that the constitutional models they're looking at are places like the US and especially Germany is really important for both of them, that is Protestant countries. So religion is based on a system of belief and even today the Chinese constitution guarantees you freedom of belief. Not freedom of association, not freedom to practice rituals, right? Not other ways of thinking about religion, but freedom of belief is, is at the core there. It has sacred texts, it has a clergy, it's joined voluntarily. Very much a Protestant understanding of religion and one that leaves some categories of things, at least anthropologists would call religion, in limbo. For instance, Confucianism. Doesn't, kind of has sacred texts, doesn't exactly have a clergy, belief isn't particularly relevant to it, nor is voluntary choice. Doesn't really fit. Folk religion doesn't fit at all. And so none of these were religion as it was institutionalized. And as I said, they, they both largely had unfriendly attitudes. That is, the nationalists, the KMT in, in uh, China before 1949 and in Taiwan after 1949, the Japanese for those 50 years in Taiwan, the Communist Party after 1949 on the mainland, None of them were very friendly to any of this. The one exception is the, the KMT is nicer to Christianity. That's the only one that really is treated somewhat differently. All right, so religion then becomes the realm of the spiritual, not the realm of how you organize the coffin makers, not the realm of how you organize your trade and business, right? but the realm of the spiritual only. You're not supposed to go do philanthropic work, for instance. You're supposed to be in church. All right, so those are two, two closely related ones that really are important from the beginning of the 20th century, secularization and uh, re religionization, for lack of a better word. The other two, rationalization, let me be quick on rationalization, uh, because at least many of you, certainly all the faculty, know the Max Weber argument about uh, that the rise of Protestantism and its role in the beginnings of capitalism in Europe, and he points out that the crucial contribution of, of um, Protestant belief was that it urged people, it forced people to rationalize their lives, to make all of their life, every aspect of their life, consistent with God's will. And that transformed the way they behaved in the marketplace, among other places. And he said there always had been rationalization in religion, but it was extra-worldly rationalization. That is, if you became a monk, you know, a Benedictine in the monastery, that was a very rationalized kind of life in exactly this sense, but it was one that separated you from the regular world. Protestantism for him was the one that opened that up in, the, in everyday life for everyday people. So Buddhism too, very rationalized in the monastery, but not really outside of that. So rationalization, but the point of rationalization isn't whether Weber was right or not. Most people, the most historians of Europe either think he was wrong or want to complicate his argument quite a bit. That's not the point. What's going on now in religions all over the world is a process of rationalization. That is, people are thinking more about what does it mean to be a Christian. So it's one thing to be a Christian because you, your parents were and your grandparents and your great-grandparents and everybody was, and being a Christian means singing some songs once a week and having Christmas. It's another thing to say, I'm gonna really read the Bible and I'm gonna think about it. I'm gonna ask myself how I should be living. Muslims, so what people, what study, scholars of Islam are calling Islamization, they don't really mean conversion to Islam very much. What they mean is Muslims who've always lived as Muslims but are suddenly asking themselves, what does it mean to be a Muslim? How should I live as a Muslim? Is it really important for me to cover my hair as a woman? Is it really important for me to pray five times a day? This is a 20th century movement in Islam. Now there've been earlier ones too, but it's very much a modern movement. Judaism, too, there's been a real move to text and away from just mm, family habitus uh, as a way of doing it. Fundamentalism this return to text, right? Let's return to the genuine practice and not to this encrusted, ritualized stuff of our parents and grandparents. Um, in that sense, we need to see fundamentalisms in all these religions and Hinduism and everything else as a fundamentally modern kind of movement rather than a return to tradition. All right, so that's one. I'm not going to say any more, mostly for time reasons, about, about uh, rationalization. Uh, I think people are probably familiar with the argument. Embodiment is a little bit more unexpected. It's talked about less. 
Um, what I'm thinking about here initially is the Pentecostal movement in Christianity. The 20th century movement that most people would date to the Azusa Street Revival, which was 19, you guys probably know better than me, 06, 1906, thank you, uh, 1906, and spreads, it just spreads everywhere, all around the world, surprisingly quickly, and it spreads to China too. Uh, so for instance, the True Jesus Church, which is still important in China and in, in uh, Taiwan as well, it's an indigenizing form of Christianity, um, that if you ask them their own history, they'll, they'll say, oh, it has nothing to do with what was going on in the US or any place else. God came you know, directly to us and gave us these gifts. But it's the same gifts that he gave the people in Los Angeles, right? Speaking in tongues, healing by laying on hands, uh, uh, um, prophecy, right? Those, that same, that collection of gifts that go with this form of religion. So this is what I mean by embodied religion. In a sense, nothing's more embodied than speaking in tongues. Especially, I mean, I've gone to true Jesus services. They're speaking in tongues is not like language at all. It's not like any language. Sometimes people speak in tongues and they say, it's Aramaic, right? Or in Taiwan, non-Christians would do this and say, it's English. Would I please come and you know, tell them what the guy's saying? But of course, the day that I went, it happened not to be English. It was some unknown language. So I, I never heard the English. But uh, some of it sounds like language. This stuff these guys do, doesn't it? They're just like trilling their tongue or saying la, 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 over and over and over. But that's kind of the ultimate speaking in tongues. That's the true language. That's the language only God can give you because that's the one language you can't lie with. Right? Every actual human language you can always deceive. This language you can't. This language is true in a, in a way that regular human language can't be true. But how embodied, right? How embodied? It's not a language you can think a thought in. It's only a language you can do. And we see this well beyond Christianity, too. Santeria, uh, spirit possession movements of all kinds, the growth of witchcraft in Africa, which is, again, modern, even though it harks back to older practices. It's modern. So I'm not going to talk much about it, um, but I, embodiment covers a lot of ground. It's a kind of trendy word in anthropology, but covers some rather different things. One kind is customary. So, you know, if you're in China at a popular temple, a folk temple, the really typical thing to see is a mother teaching a little kid how to burn incense to a deity. And so they'll kneel down in front of the altar, and the mom will be behind the little boy, say, and there'll be some incense in the little boy's hand, and the mom's hand is grasped from behind around the little boy's hands, and she'll be going like this, teaching him the body movements. She's explaining nothing. There's no theology there, right? She's teaching a body practice. So that's what I mean by customary. So the second kind is embodiment that comes to you from the outside. The Holy Spirit, right? That would be one form of that spirit possession in other kinds of traditions. So that's the second. I'll talk a little bit about both of those. The third one is the kind that comes from the inside. It's quite important in China. That is, it's a power that you cultivate from within you. Medi think of Zen meditation or something like that. that. That's important in China today, but I'm not going to talk about it. Now, this isn't the opposite of rationalization. They can both coexist. They can coexist in the same church at the same time, the same Buddhist group at the same time. So I'll, I'll give some examples. So time for pictures, right? Why else use PowerPoint? So this is Mazu. Um, uh, Wang Xiaoli mentioned Mazu briefly this morning already. This is Taiwan. Mazu's birthday, just to show you the scale of it. This is what I mean by customary embodiment, right? So this is to show you the growth. And this is, in the 19th century, it was never this big. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to make the claim here that this is part of a global movement that's actually increased over the 20th century. So without spending any more time on the, on the slides, highly embodied, it's ritual performance that really matters. It's not very rationalizing at all. There are no texts. Um, priests you have to hire from other traditions. It, you know, it just doesn't fit that definition at all. Uh, I think that, well, let me just mention the desecularizing. That is, it, it's, it's reintegrating religion into other aspects of life by doing philanthropy, for instance. That's what all those examples are, but I won't talk more about that today. Uh, let me go to Jiangsu. Jiangsu is north of Mazu's territory in China or I thought it was, but it turns out there's Mazu temples all over China. There's Mazu temples in Xinjiang that go back to the Qing Dynasty. Yes, 
And there are two Mazu temples in Nanjing, the capital of Jiangsu, where I was living, um, that are functioning today. They're both old. One was the guild for people from Fujian, which is Mazu's core area, who were in Nanjing. And the other was founded by Zheng He. Those of you who know China know who he was. One of them is run. So um, Wang Xiaoli's point was there's no place for this kind of religion. But of course, there is a place if you're willing to fudge. The place is one of these two temples is run by the Taoists, and the other one is run by the Buddhists. A bizarre situation, but that that's how the government chose to do it. But who's really doing this? The government is doing this. The United Front Work Department, which is the Communist Party branch in charge of religious policy, but also in charge of cross-straits relationships with Taiwan. They're the ones in charge. And those of you who can read Chinese, I I, this is probably not legible to you, but the, the uh, yellow thing on the bottom is a list of donors to the construction, to the reopening of this temple. Um, it's a typical thing you find in temples. The very first line, they gave 16,000 um, yuan. It says, the, uh, I think it's the Nanjing, Nanjing City United Front Department, the Communist Party, and the Religious Affairs Bureau. It's the government and the party. And remember, the party, you're not allowed to have religion, any religion, and be a member of the party. I was shocked, not shocked that they were supporting this, they're doing it for United Front reasons, shocked that they would give money and give it openly, right? So everybody can see what's going on. Uh, the other temple, very similar kind of situation. So at the same time, village temples are really active in Jiangsu, also not to Taiwan's level, but still very active. This is, again, customary embodied religion. And there are all kinds of other activity. Here's an example. This is a Buddhist, this is one of the larger Buddhist temples in Nanjing, Jimingsi, on New Year's Eve, Chinese New Year. So this is like sometime around midnight. First of all, just to show you the crowd, but look at the people too, not just the numbers, look at the age. They're young. I don't think you can see a single, I mean, I'm not sure what you can see in that photo, but there's no gray hair in that picture. So there's thousands and thousands of people in that picture. There's no gray hair. They're all young, and they all look pretty sincere. So it's New Year's Eve. People are out for a good time, right? But these aren't your drunken revelers. This isn't your Keen State Turkey Day thing or a Pumpkin Day thing. Um, right, this is a different deal. And this, I just, I wanted to bring back this morning's talks, right? Is this religion? If you ask some of those people, they'll say, yes, they're Buddhist. If you ask most of those people, they'll say, no. They'll look surprised, like, what a weird question. Yeah, I'm burning incense in a Buddhist temple at an important cosmological moment, but they don't think of it as religion. So just, you know, something to think about as we, as we think about that category. Anyway, embodied religion. So why are they there? Good luck, something to do, right? That, this is embodied religion. There's no theology. They can't come up with a theological explanation. It's not very rationalized. Embodiment. This slide is shorthand for two really, really good stories that I don't have time to tell you. The medium in Changshu is another city in southern Jiangsu. This, this is a Chinese spirit medium. He, I went to go see him, and he fought a woman possessed by a monkey demon, a Hu Zijing. Like, right there. It was the best thing I ever saw the whole year I was there. <laughs> and you don't get to hear this story because they didn't give me enough time. The second one is the True Jesus Church, which I spent some time um, working with in Nanjing. It's a pretty successful congregation. It was refounded in 1993. Um, they fill up their church every, they, they worship on Saturdays. Every Saturday, 400 plus people show up. They've baptized probably a couple thousand people since then. Um, speak in tongues, right? So every prayer, they fall to their knees and they speak in tongues. Everybody. And I, again, the, the uh, preacher who refounded it, she has this fantastic story about it, but I, you're not going to hear that either. Um, the pictures are from Taiwan. The pictures are from Taiwan. They're spirit mediums in Taiwan. All right, so just to say it's not all embodied. There's a lot of rationalizing religion going on, too. The famous examples from Taiwan, Tsiji, Fu Guangshan, Buddha Light, uh, Dharma Drum, some of those were mentioned already this morning. They tend to downplay ritual, downplay the embodied aspect. Lots of preaching, lots of text study, lots of stuff that would sound very familiar to Protestants. And 
Then there's Protestants, right? It's not all true Jesus Church. There's a lot of just mainstream Protestants like you would see in mainstream congregations in the US, very rationalized religion uh, for the most part. Uh, that's just, that's Siji's headquarters in China, in Suzhou, and some of their volunteers. Siji does basically philanthropic work. All right, just some shared trends. Rationalizing in religion is increasing in both places. Embodied religion is increasing in both places. It crosses religious lines. So we see both trends in Christianity. We see both trends in Buddhism. Those two are by far the most important religious trends. Um, many traditional practices have not just survived, but grown. Um, and you know, so why are the two places so similar when the politics have been so different for more than a century? I think it speaks to two things. One is the importance of shared tradition. The other is the importance of global trends over the importance of political differences. But there are differences. Indigenous religion is much more thriving in Taiwan than in China. Um, and there, I think we see some of the political explanations that you heard this morning, so I won't, I won't reiterate um, those things. But it, it also means that even sh should the PRC government ease up on traditional practices at this point, it may not end up like Taiwan. It may not turn into the like, crazy thriving traditional religion that you get in Taiwan, uh, just because the infrastructure has been destroyed for a lot of that. Buddhists and Christians. So if you're just looking in principle in the abstract, Taiwan should be the place for Christianity to be doing really well. All those leaders, Feng Gong mentioned in his talk, um, all the other religions were controlled in ways very similar to what the communists do on the mainland. They had to register, they had to be parts of formal state-run associations, except for Christians. Um, all foreign missionaries had to flee China after the early 1950s, and a bunch of them went to Taiwan. So while China had this emptying out of missionary presence, Taiwan had this huge growth in missionary presence. So we have a, a sympathetic government, a lot of whose members are Christians, um, all of these missionaries all over the place, a kind of structural system of religion control that f seems to favor Christianity, and not much Christian growth at all. In China, you already heard from the others this morning, so everything's against Christianity, um, and yet, Christianity has grown really, really rapidly. Now, part of what's happened is Christianity on the mainland has claimed modernity. That is, if you're going to be modern and religious, it's Christianity that claims to be the answer to that. They say, just look at America. Everybody's a Christian in America. Right? We want to be like that. You have to be a Christian. In Taiwan, Buddhists claim that territory. Buddhists have claimed that territory. And that's the interesting question of why, you know, how did the Buddhists pull that off? They changed. This was in the 70s, 80s. Buddhism really evolved these new ways of being in the world, of being rationalized in the Weberian sense in the world. In China, it hasn't, mostly because of the form of government control, I would say. Buddhism is much more collaborative with the government in uh, China than in Taiwan. So again, suppose the government totally relaxed. Would we end up with Taiwan that has just become a totally Buddhist place? I wouldn't bet on it. And the reason is the ecosystem, if you can use that, the religious ecosystem is already very different in the two places. I don't think you can take the path of one and trace the path of the other. The same goes for civil life. I've made an argument in the alternate civilities book that was mentioned um, that these religious groups were quite important in Taiwan's democratization, not so much in creating the transition as in allowing it to consolidate. And although I hadn't thought of it in these terms, my reasons are actually quite similar to uh, James Chun's resilience discussion. It was that ability to create social capital, Dennis, I got social capital in there, to create social capital, um, um, that's a resource you have to have if you're gonna be democratized. And within an authoritarian regime, there are not that many mechanisms to allow you to do that. That happened in Taiwan. To some extent, it's happening in China too, in spite of government policy. And yet it could work out really differently. The idea of a Taiwan model we had a Taiwan land reform model, a Taiwan economic model, and now we have a Taiwan democratization model. None of them has transferred well out of Taiwan because the systems are different enough, and I think that's true in China as well. I don't see that as a pessimistic conclusion, just one that says, don't look to Taiwan for answers, look to China for answers. And with that, thank you. <laughs>